प्लीज गो इट सर वी आर लाइव नाउ You are mute, I think. Hello. Yes, now. All right. So, good morning, everyone. Once again, I welcome you all uh, to this uh, webinar, which is conducted by SHM and the Western Council. I am Bharat Patel. Uh, the chairman for the startups and skill development at uh, SHM, the Western Council. I welcome all the participants who have already joined and those who are going to join in a short while from now. I presume everybody is going to be there. We welcome the guests today. We have uh, Professor Anil Shastabude, the Honorable Chairman of the IICT Government of uh, India, who actually needs no introduction in the field of education. He has been immensely contributing. Moderator of this today's session will be Dr. Jitendra K. Das, Director of Kore School of Management in Delhi. We have with us uh, Sri Harish Sanduja, Director of Sheikh An Anandaram Jaipuria Group of Schools, and also a member of the Academic Council, Samakya uh, Teachers Training Academy and Research from Ghaziabad. We have Sri Achin Bhattacharya, CEO and founder of uh, Notebook. Dr. Mahendra Sharma, Pro Vice Chancellor and Director General Ganpat University in Gujarat. Dr. Umesh Chandra Jain, Secretary of the North Zone Association of Chemistry Teachers, Mumbai, and Principal Academics, High Public School. We have Sri Saurabh Kumar, Director of Academics of Vidya Mandir Classes, and Dr. Amit Joshi, Director of uh, Global Knowledge Research Foundation. We're all grateful uh, to your presence and which is highly appreciated. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all those experts who are there today with us and going to contribute to this um, you know, seminar that we have today. And I believe uh, during this COVID time, it's uh, all the more important that this digital platform is bringing us all together. You know, we, we, we understand, we understand that um, it, it's been uh, very, very uh, vital that you know, we get on to uh, whatever that we are working on in a digital format. And this has become almost a new normal. And now not taking much of the time, let's uh, get on to the virtual conference that we have today. And we all know that uh, the Indian government of India has introduced the National Education Policy of 2020, which in a way is going to be transforming the entire nation, both at the school level and at the higher education sector. This, first of all, you know, this is the, I would say that this NEP 2020 is perhaps a 21st century, which is going to replace the 34 year old, the you know, national education policy that we have. And it's going to be tremendously advantageous to the whole nation because the nation building is based on the basic ethos of education, which is primarily based on the pillars of accessibility, equality, quality, affordability, and accountability at each sectors. And I'm sure, you know, this is going to be adding to the sustainable development goals that we have of 2030, and um, right from the school to the college level. Because, uh, you know, this is where I believe that, you know, me being from the area of, um, you know, a business line where we know that there is a gap between the academia and the requirements of the, of the you know, industries, this is where it's going to really bridge in. So this NEP 2020 will lead to a growth and will drive the education requirements of the young population. I think it will be better learning for the employment outcome for the younger generation. And SHM really believes that this NEP 2020 is going to set the salient teachers which have been actually been set across by our honorable prime minister for the skill development program, which has been envisaged by him. And also, you know, the Pradhan Mantri Kaushal uh, Vikas uh, Yojana, which he has. Because 
this is the skill which is eventually, if, even if you look at the overall uh, GDP of the nation, I think the MSME contributes to a larger extent and where MSME would actually be employed people at, at, at a various levels, right from the down till the top level and skill is going to be a major factor therein. So if we look at some of the analytics, you know, which have been there, you know, which I just uh, got to know that there are 3.74 crore students who are enrolled in 50,000 plus institutions, which is humongous. And perhaps when we look at these numbers, these numbers are perhaps greater than some of the entire population of smaller countries in the globe. So I think, uh, you know, uh, it is a massive task at the people who are leading the top end of the educational system. And um, you know, people like uh, Anilji, you know, who's been heading the higher education of AICT. You know, it's it's a whole gamut which needs to be seen at a very large perspective. So I believe this NEP twenty twenty is aiming at increasing the overall enrollment ratio, which from twenty six point three percent, which is in twenty eighteen, will jump up to almost around fifty percent by twenty thirty five, which is the expectations. And I believe uh, SHM Western Region Council has been looking to such kind of uh, virtual conferences which will bring in and proliferate the policies at, at a national level. National Education Policy 2020 will be actually being seen and used and use it with the impact and implementation. I think that's that's uh, what I had to address, and I'm sure this is going to be a very very useful session for everyone who are, who have joined. So I think we have um, Dr. Jitendra Das. You know who is going to moderate the session hereafter. I will just hand over to him, but I'll give a brief introduction about him. Dr. Chitendra Das, who is director of Forest School of Management in Delhi, has been a professor of marketing and a founder dean at Maida campus at IIM Lucknow, with a BTEC uh, and MTech both from IIT Delhi and a doctorate university from University of Toronto. Now, you know this is where the background of a person who's in the field and then coming into academics will really help. You know, his total years of experience is more than 38 years, and he has worked with the World Bank, he has worked in GTZ Germany, he has worked with, you know, Coal India Limited, and he's been teaching as in academics at IIM, Ahmedabad, Kozi, Kod, Lucknow, and what more. I would really appreciate that, you know, when he is moderating, you know, he would have the entire gamut of uh, understanding of the questions which people would be looking across. And he's also been awarded with numerous awards even award from the SHM Spirit Self-Reliant Award and the Leadership Award, you know, which has been given by uh, the Global Vision Outlook, the third Asia Pacific Education Technology Awards at the 2020. And, uh, you know, he, he is, the list is so long about his uh, accolades, you know, I, would, I think I, I would cut it short at this point of time and uh, I think straight Dr. Das, you can take it over. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Patel, for a, um, uh, um, uh, introduction, I accept all that with humility, uh, except one thing, I did not work for World Bank or GTZ. I was a consultant uh, to the World Bank uh, and the GTZ uh, Germany, you know, the, the, the development agency of uh, 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 the Germany at that point of time. And, uh, India, all consulting jobs, uh, landmarks, uh, things that I, and I learned a lot through these um, work executions. Um, so now coming back to uh, this uh, session on uh, National Education Policy 2020, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome the eminent speakers that we have today. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Anil Sastra Budde is the chairman of uh, the AICT. I'm really very really, um, obliged in the way that he's uh, sparing his time to uh, share his views with all of us. And in addition, we have uh, six speakers, learned speakers from the academia, who will be uh, sharing their uh, views. A brief introduction was uh, given by Mr. Patel, uh, uh, but very uh, uh, briefly, uh, Professor Sahasrapudet does not need any introduction, but I was pleasantly uh, impressed to see that he has been a professor at uh, IIT uh, Gohati, uh, and he's a technocrat. His mechanical engineering has been in the academy for many years. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Harish uh, Sanduja, who is the director of State Anantanam Jaipuria uh, School, 
And we have uh, Mr. Anil Bhattacharya, who is the CEO and founder of Notebook. It is all into high-tech uh, technology space these days. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Mahendra Sharma, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor and Director General Ganpat University in Gujarat. We have Mr. Dr. Omesh Chandra Jain, is the Secretary of North Zone of Association, Association of Chemistry Teachers, Mumbai and Principal Academy. Heights Public School. Uh, we have with us uh, Shri Saurav Kumar. He is from the Vidya Mandir classes, and Dr. Amit uh, jo jo Joshi, the Director of Global uh, Knowledge uh, Research Foundation. So we have a very wide spectrum of the speakers who would be sharing their views uh, this morning, uh, right from uh, the Apex the regulatory body AICTE, headed by uh, Professor Anil Shastar Budde. And, uh, you know, uh, if you have been in the uh, education, higher education in India for the last uh, at least uh, six, seven years, you would notice the massive changes that has happened uh, in the way the AICT has transformed itself into the new age uh, requirements. So I'm really, very really happy to welcome him again uh, to this particular uh, uh, conference. And uh, the way the ICT has uh, transformed itself into becoming more proactive is uh, uh, an indication of the way the India is going to change. And this is uh, very um, aptly reflected in the new national education policy that has been announced by the government a few months back. Uh, and the government is inviting uh, observations from uh, the people who are the stakeholders. Uh, now, this uh, particular uh, education policy, the way I see it, is, is, is like a breath of fresh air. It's so proactive and so precise in terms of outlining the, uh, the outcome desired uh, by the country and how to go about doing it. Some structural uh, reforms have already been uh, suggested. Um, now, you know, I see this NEP more as a strategy a statement for the nation. Uh, and therefore, we need to understand the, the implications of uh, making it happen. Now, I have been a professor of uh, marketing earlier uh, at IIM Lucknow. Uh, so we, I try to look at everything from the marketing perspective, essentially because in marketing, you know, you cannot uh, uh, beat around the bush because you have to come up with performance. You know, if you're in sales, you have to show the numbers. And any background story has uh, no meaning. You know? I mean, you don't give me a story, uh, you show me the performance. And I have been in sales. I worked for Wipro those days in, in sales. So I have that experience. So our bosses would give you the freedom to do anything that you want to do. But once it comes to performance appraisal, you need to give the figures. And any explanation you give for a poor performance is not accepted. So I come from that kind of an orientation. And therefore, in marketing, we also always talk of that you need to have a very good strategy to be successful in uh, the sales performance. Uh, but then there are instances where the strategy is very good, but the performance does not match the objective. You know, you have a good strategy, but it doesn't work out well. Uh, and it is said that it does not work out well because the implementation was not efficient. Yeah, you have a strategy. And then you go around to implement. Implementation is not efficient. It fails. The entire thing fails. While there are also examples uh, where the strategy is not very good, and then you start implementing, and the performance is not happening, the smart CEO will figure out there's something wrong here, and they rejig the entire thing. So they set aside the strategy and figure out their own creative ways to reach the target. And anybody who's in sales and marketing would know this. And I actually, in classes, you do in marketing strategy class, you teach these uh, things with uh, business examples. So the point I'm trying to make here is it's uh, important to have a good strategy, which helps you greatly. So we have the NEP, which is a great strategic statement. It's actually a wonderful document uh, if you read through it uh, thoroughly uh, in terms of what is desirable and how the government wants to take it forward to bring it to the international level. Now. Uh, Internationally speaking, the higher education has no, so to speak, a value perception outside India. You know, if you have a PhD from from India, they don't uh, give a, uh, you know, um, uh, any attention to that. For a PhD from IIT, you get some respect from IIC and uh, you get some respect. From IIM also, they don't value so much, uh, you know, a PhD. That's the hard thing. Only the last five years, I would say, the perception has started changing 
with the international ranking of the IIMs and IITs slightly improving, particularly the IIMs improving uh, substantially, not even the IITs in the international ranking. Uh, so it is the right time for us to uh, uh, leapfrog into the main stream in terms of reputation of education, because the talent in India is uh, is uh, the best that you could find in the world. If, and the dividends is the way the Indians perform when they go outside India. You go to the US, go to Europe, and see how the Indians are performing. So why does Indians in India don't perform well, but Indians in outside India, they perform so well? Is because of the work environment and the way you look at uh, you know uh, things. So we need to understand it from that perspective. You know how it would work well in an Indian setting. Now to give you an idea of what problems we have, we need to understand why way back in 1950s the IIMs were created outside the university system. Okay, and also not uh, the way IITs were created. They wanted some kind of a performance out of the IIM. So they thought that it should not go into the university system. It should not go into in the IIT Act of Parliament. Let it be like a society so they can do anything and everything they want to do, right? So give no restrictions and make them excel in terms of their objectives. So IIMs are an iconic institution today. Uh, they have a higher rating uh, in terms of international, particularly business school point of view, than IITs in that sense, if you look at the overall rating. Uh, so we need to learn from why this has happened. Now, when you look at the execution or the implementation of it, the Indian cultural system has a very important role to play. Now, I'll give you an example, uh, uh, just to illustrate that point, how the Indians do things when they are in a position of power. Now, I have a cook at home, so on a weekday, 3 p.m., he called me. The cook comes in the morning, comes in the evening. So he called me saying, Ki, sir, wo, uh, uh, corona ka test I had a camp. Laga tha. You know, there was a camp. So I got and done my corona test, and they asked me to come back in half an hour to know. So I went there in half an hour later, and I asked him, Ki, kya hua? So the guy who's sitting to inform, he says, Ki, tum negative ho. you are negative, jao. So he left. So he didn't know what's the meaning of negative. You know, he's a cook. So he went back again after uh, half an hour. He went back to the counter asking this guy, Ki, sir, ye corona negative ka kya matlab hua? Now the guy who was handling this booth reprimanded him, said, you bhaga yaha se, time di mere pas. So this guy left, right? He didn't know what is corona negative. So he called me, right? Sir, ye corona negative bata rahe, iska kya matlab hai? Toh mainne kaha, khush ho jau, tumko kuch nahi hua, it's all fine. Now the guy who's at the booth, this is his attitude. And this attitude reflects the attitude of most of Indians, right? So he, instead of being friendly and telling him, ki tumko kuch nahi hai, achha hai, tum chale jau, this guy reprimands him, that mere paas time nahi hai, chale jau. Now you imagine the amount of effort that you'd have required on that part of that guy manning the booth to explain to him ki tumko kuch nahi hua. You see, this is attitude. Now uh, we have similar attitudinal issues coming from the regulators sometimes. You know, people in position of power, they conduct themselves in a, a different way. And there are umpteen examples of this. You know, uh, I have been in IIM, so it's a sanitized environment. I come to four school of management, uh, we have to deal with the regulators and NBA, the government agencies. So this is a very different experience. And always I, you know, say that why do people have to interact like this? This is not at the top level. It is at the lowest level. You know, in the in the government department, when you you go to a BDO office in the village, and you go to the lower level, see how the people interact there. You know the attitude of people. So we need to have a uh, a, a, a framework in which the execution of NEP does not run into what is called in IT domain a last mile connection problem. Okay, that means execution goes through as it is expected to go. Right. So, so if you don't have the last mile connection, it'll be fine. If you have a last mile connection problem, it will fail. Like, for example, I'll give you an example. I got a call. I got a mail from a regulator. Uh, uh, Dr. Sasudra is here at 5.35 on a Friday evening that you have a meeting on Tuesday, some aspect. And so that's okay. And at 5.35. So that's fine. So weekends, we don't work. So Monday, we say, and the link will be sent. The link was not sent. Monday, don't know, link came. Tuesday at uh, around 4.30 or so afternoon, a call comes uh, to one of the staff saying, and in a very, uh, you know, like, almost like aggressive voice, 
कि वो लिंक हमने भेज दिया तुम तुरंत लाइन पर आओ फॉर दैट मीटिंग दिस इज शेड्यूल्ड मीटिंग नाउ लकीली वी वर देयर हैड वी नॉट बीन देयर वी हैव मिस दैट मीटिंग सो वो फोन ऑनलाइन किया तब वो आया तो व्हाई डू वी हैव टू ऑपरेट लाइक दिस यू नो दिस इज नॉट अ प्रोफेशनल वे ऑफ ऑपरेटिंग नाउ व्हेन यू हैव दीस थिंग्स हैपनिंग एट द लोएस्ट लेवल दिस इज नॉट अ हायर लेवल हायर लेवल पॉलिसीज हैव बीन फ्रेम्ड everything has been worked out well but execution you have these little bit of hiccups and issues coming in because of some inefficiency that creeps in at the lower level so understanding indian ethos we need to be very sensitive to how do we handle prevent these last mile connection problems and one solution to this which we do at for example at our institution is have an sop standard operating procedure for anything and everything that is to be done any output that is desired out of an activity there must be an sop now we you know all those high end corporates have a sop for anything and everything so it ensures the activities are done exactly the way it is designed to be done so we need to ensure that sops are written down for the people particularly at the level where they are actually executing the nep policy Uh, like for example if i give a document for a research funding to one of the uh, verticals of nep and then i have to keep following up to know what is happening and nobody responds so what do i do so it will not work out so there must be an sop when they discounts uh, how the things are going to be actually responded to so if it is written down and the, and that written down thing is in the public domain so people would know that they are supposed to respond back to you in two days time three day time 30 days time 365 days time that's okay so you you plan and you wait accordingly and they also have a sense of responsibility that it has to be done like this and to give you an example that how this has done wonders for the government's operation is the import export licensing licensing system that was reformed by the pm of that time mr rajiv gandhi because i was dealing with some of those activities in my early days in my job so import export license if you experienced it it was a horrendous task and very corrupt system so rajiv gandhi made a policy that within x number of days this queries have to be uh, raised and you cannot introduce new query which was happening earlier on and so once the response come it is frozen and now you have to say yes or no if you give no license then you have to explain and so that was the reform way back in the early mid 80s so i'm giving you an example so that was an sop uh, in a way which was implemented by the government of india in rajiv gandhi's time likewise the nep we need to be very sensitive to how do we do things uh, you know so that the implementation It does not have uh, hiccups, and the vision of the visionaries who have drafted this uh, wonderful document actually uh, sees the, as we say, uh, light of the day, and and it uh, delivers uh, for the nation uh, what it deserves. So India deserves because this NAP policy also has uh, referred to uh, your uh, uh, Takshila, um, uh, Nalanda, and uh, um, uh, Vikram Shila. They were uh, the iconic institutions of its days. So we can also learn. Uh, and they did not have any international collaboration okay so nalanda or takshila did not have any international collaboration because there was none at that point of time so they were excelling on their own so we don't always have to have international uh, collaboration to excel the talent is there internally so we need to foster a system where the talent uh, is uh, exploited to the held that people are able to come out with their uh, ability and there is no depth of ability in india okay so so and and it also talks of uh, uh, the uh, uh, one bhats uh, 64 kala <laughs> which is uh, the concept of liberal arts today so we have all those wisdoms existing so somehow all these thing got lost uh, down the line so we need to learn how they were able to create those innovative things in its uh, at their own time so the talent exists we not assume that we have to have international collaboration only then we will improve that assumption must not be there uh, you need to create a, a work environment where the talent which is there inherent in our indians uh, are able to come out and they can do wonderful things and there are umpteen examples where the restrictions have been imposed by international bodies on india and india has come out with a wonderful solution on its own there are umpteen examples we don't have time for that but there are so i share these examples with my students that you know so once you are under pressure you know when the things become tough the tough gets going you know 
like that yeah so so we need to uh, understand the nep from that perspective and i'm sure the uh, the government will uh, look at that from that perspective so now let's have these uh, uh, wonderful speakers uh, who are with us uh, this uh, morning and it's my great pleasure to uh, invite uh, professor anil sas budde to share his uh, uh, views on uh, the perspectives of nep uh, 2020 professor anil sas budde please uh, thank you uh, professor jitendra das uh... We have Bharat Patel, uh, I know Amit Joshi for a long time, and many others, of course, on the panel who are there here. Uh, you have pitched a very strong pitch for what is there in new education policy, which is transformative, which is uh, uh, game-changing in one way in terms of policy, because uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan, with his experience of ISRO, has put in all that is required in order to put into the policy, and that's why from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, and I keep saying Kutch to Konoma in Kohima, which is the green village, uh, the policy has been appreciated all around. But that apart, unless it is implemented in the right way, the, uh, you know, we all say that uh, the, the taste or whatever is there after you enjoy that only, you'll know it. You know? So therefore, implementation becomes important. And the seriousness of the government is visible from the very fact that on 29th July, when it was announced, 7th of August, within a week, uh, a seminar, webinar like this was organized by the UGC MHRD. And uh, none other than Prime Minister spoke for 45 minutes on the new education policy. That shows the sincerity. And subsequently, he has spoken two, three times, including Indian diaspora abroad, uh, which was organized by DRDO and so on and so forth. So and the president has... Uh, arranged a meeting of all uh, centrally funded institutions like IITs, IIMs, and central universities. I think the government's uh, commitment to implement the policy is visible. Now, the brass tracks policy is to be in the form of implementable action points. And that is what Prime Minister also said, that we need to have the strategy, we must have the action plan, we must have a mechanism of a review. And if there is a problem, course correction, I think all of that has to be in place. and. The ministry is right now working with different committees to create an implementation plan. I hope in a month or two, this will be rolled out. All of you will come to know for exactly how all of those things are going to be done. Now, a few things which uh, Dr. Das said, I would like to uh, contradict some of them. That is important as well, because otherwise people will get a wrong impression about a regulating body. So, uh, no, 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 I would like to do that. The reason is uh, the, the regulatory body certainly has its role, but it should not uh, go into uh, what you say, snooping into the uh, issues that the institution is doing. That is why that autonomy, which you said, is important. Why did IIMs do well? Because uh, they were fairly autonomous, independent. Now that with an act of parliament, they are fully autonomous, in, in fact, uh, legally also, in terms of uh, parliamentary law, but otherwise also, uh, the government was funding, but was not interfering as much as it does probably sometimes in IITs. And that's why IIT is not able to excel as much. And the policy talks about giving autonomy to all the institutions. I think this is very important. But the, at the same breath, uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan has coined a very beautiful word, and that is uh, the regulation must be light but tight. And many people keep asking, what is this light means and what is this tight means? And I have, in my own way, interpreted it. I have not had a direct interaction about why he used these words. But uh, light is the entire process of approvals and institutions must be coming forward in the form of self-disclosure, which is there today in company law. You have board of directors, their, uh, uh, what activities they are doing. Everything is transparently available. In the same way, educational institutions should inform what all facilities they have, what all they do, they don't do, so that stakeholder is fully aware before taking admission. And there are institutions who are not taking approval of AICT, but still are supposed to be uh, top rated. I will not name the institution, you all know about it. Uh, and they still get dues fees charged to the students, and students get good jobs. This is also happening in the same country. So that means there is on one side, without regulation also, institutions have functioned well. And people respect that on one side. On the other side, there are people who make, you know, misuse the facility that is available. And, and, and there are also what we call as fly-by-night operators. So I think the, between the two, we need a 
body of regulation, and that's why this light by tight that every institution should be autonomous. They should display what they have, don't have, what they offer, what they do, everything transparently on their website and let the stakeholders still decide to go there or not go. It is his choice. And the fee to be charged also could be flexible. You know, they, they have their own option of doing what, what they want to do. So this is what is light. But now having said that, you openly say that this is what I have and I'm doing this transparently on your website you, so far, but actually you are not following that. And then a stakeholder comes and finds that, you know, so many faculty are there you are claiming, but you have less than half the faculty that you are claiming. One or two faculty resigning is fine, you know, and new faculty are to be recruited. But if you say that I have got 100 faculty and actually on board, uh, there are only 50 of them. And a student will write a complaint to a regulatory body. They have to take tight action on the institution. And that is what is being talked about. And then in the form which we have designed as a regulatory body, everyone is required to apply every year. And we have given a lot of uh, uh, graded autonomy of called uh, class one, class two, et cetera, based on the NB accreditation levels so that they get full independence and autonomy, almost like IAPS. You know, that is what AICT has already done in the last two years. But having said this, if there is a information to be given, and if you give whatever information in a wrong manner, and then uh, you are not given a certain approval, then cribbing about it later that it was simple, to do mein mana kiya tha. So for example, committees for the grievances of SCST, sexual harassment committee, these are on very simple. In half an hour, one can form a committee without forming a committee and saying that we don't have a committee and if some approval which is additional required is not given and then cribbing about it later and then getting penalized and paying heavy penalty. I don't want to mention the name, but everyone who is aware, they know it. So I don't want to say that. So I think that is where light but tight is important. Now, leaving apart that, what is significant in the policy few elements I will say and then leave it at that. One of the things it is saying is all educational institutions must be multidisciplinary. That means uh, a management school need not be or continue to be as a pure management school, but they must inculcate some other programs. Maybe it can be commerce, which may be related, uh, economics program, BA economics, arts, you may have a, a science program, you may have engineering program, you have a architecture program, any program so that you become multidisciplinary so that students who come there will get a taste of a lo lot of variety actually. That is the implicate, implicit meaning. IITs, although they started as technical institutions, gradually had a strong physics, chemistry, mathematics department, the sciences, subsequently even humanities and social sciences. Some of the IITs like IIT Kharagpur has gone ahead and has a law faculty. They are also talking about management, of course, is there for a long time. And then also they are having now a medical school being started there. So I think this is what is multidisciplinary, what uh, the policy talks about and how do we do it? There are challenges because there are 50,000 odd institutions and policy says it should be reduced to about 1,500 to 2,000. And there are full thousand universities already existing. And another parameter which says is those districts where there are no universities, that is deprived uh, sections of the society have to be handled and therefore government has to open new universities in those districts where the university does not exist. And these are very few in number, but there are. There are about 150, 200 in number. Probably more districts happen because of division of districts also. So there are about 150, 200 districts where you may have to open new, uh, completely new universities by the government. This role is for the government. But even existing institutions, how do they collaborate with each other? A management institution with uh, a arts college or a science college and an engineering school, and then offer programs which are multidisciplinary. So this is one challenge which we'll have to address, and which is very important to give the taste of uh, the multidisciplinarity and all future innovations, research will happen always in the cross boundaries between different disciplines. Having known that, we should adopt that, and that is first thing. Second thing is uh, banking of credits. You need not do the entire program for one single university or college. You may also have some credits taken from some other institution and then attach it to your transcript in your organization. That is what is already existing in terms of 20% credits being allowed uh, by the SWAM courses or the MOOC courses. We can increase it and already UGC has taken a decision to make it 40%. So there can be a lot of online education possible even in a regular mode. 
So you have some regular courses and some 30 to 40 percent of the courses you can take from some other institution, which you feel, you know, it's a freedom to both students as well as the institution. You decide which institution, say I am Bangalore's this course, I am uh, Lucknow's this course, this we would like to adopt. And you don't have your faculty, therefore you will take it or you have seen that there are better faculty than yours in that institute, so you allow that to your students to do it. So both these models are possible. Third one is multiple exit and multiple entry, which are again a challenging one. Uh, saying this is very easy, but doing that is going to be a biggest challenge and therefore implementation, if you want, this is going to be a real problem. If there is a four-year program is undergraduate engineering, four-year BA program, after one year a student wants to quit, what kind of certificate will you give? What kind of achievements is he able to do and serve the society or himself? I think that challenge is going to be there. Therefore, bridge courses when he goes out so that he becomes empowered, he becomes employable is also one necessity. Or one year down the line, not allowed, but at least after two years allowed, some way of uh, tweaking with the curriculum, I think there are many challenges. Secondly, from one institution, if you are jumping to another institution at the end of two years, a person who is leaving an institution, for him it's fine. But an institution which assumed that he has that student in its umbrella and uh, assumes that four years we will collect so much fees and therefore we are able to maintain the whole infrastructure and suddenly more than 50% of the students leave, there are challenges. Therefore, what is allowed, what is not allowed, what are the lower limits, what are the upper limits, in which case we should allow. I think in implementation, there will be huge challenges. Secondly, by taking credits from four school of management, if someone wants to go to IIM Lucknow, what portion of those credits are allowed? And then definition of credit itself. Different institutions define credits in terms of either number of classes held per week or number of engagement hours or number of study hours that the student is to put in in order to learn that subject. So I think there are different definitions of the credit itself. So the standardization or handshake between institutions, I think these are very, very uh, prominent challenges while implementation plan is being discussed by us in our institutions. These are all coming forward. Then comes the regulation and the regulatory function. Instead of uh, multiple regulatory bodies like UGC, AICT, NCT, uh, Council of Architecture, uh, and so on and so forth. There are 30 odd councils in our country. So how do we bring them down to only one council? Of course, they have ex exempted uh, law and medicine, so those two will be remaining. But other than these two, all other councils, how can they be put under one umbrella? Under what is na named as uh, National uh, uh, Commission, uh, that is a, uh, like an umbrella organization, which is called HECI, Higher Education Commission of India, with four verticals. One vertical taking care of the regulation, second one of funding, third one of accreditation, fourth one of standard setting norms. Uh, and this is what is, is another challenge, because existing acts of UGC, AICT have to be uh, negated. That means a new act has to be passed by both the houses of parliament. And then in, the, in that act, you should clearly mention that AICT, UGC does not exist here after. So I, I think this clarity, if it is not there, there are problems. I, I am aware of AICT Act itself, which has pharmacy and architecture written in our uh, AICT Act, but the Council of Architecture Act or Pharmacy Act is not uh, uh, taken away, nor the role of them in terms of AICT being regulating this is defined. And therefore, we were both dabbling into the institutions who run the program of architecture and pharmacy. Now, finally, Supreme Court had to say that AICT will not do anything. Let it be done by pharmacy council because it's a specialist organization. Architecture is a specialist organization. I think such nuances have to be understood and in the act of parliament, when HECI bill comes in, all these nitty gritty details have to be there so that future legal complications do not arise. Multiple people fighting for the same spot do not arise. I think. These are some other challenges which need to be done by the, the government. Uh, the last one which I will say and stop here is, uh, you rightly pointed out that whereas IITs and IISC is known for research, a lot of their activities in terms of research ranking is pretty good uh, in terms of number of publications. But when it comes to IIMs, uh, it is not as good. And therefore, the fellow program of uh, IIMs is not recognized as almost equivalent to PhD, even within the country, forget about uh, the foreign country. And therefore, what the transformation is required in, in the fellow program. 
Uh, now you don't even have to call it as a fellow because most of the IIMs have already got this liberty to become a, like a university award degree. They can do PhD exactly the same way as IITs and universities do. But when it comes to standalone management institutions who will continue to be there for some time, till they become degree awarding institutions as per the policy, they will also get the authority. Uh, if you do a, a better quality of accreditation, prove it over a period of time, they will all become a degree awarding institutions but the number of such institutions have to be reduced. So those who are not performing, they will have their natural death. You know, our Darwin's law of uh, natural selection will happen and subsequently less number of institutions will remain. And those who, who will remain will be all good quality institutions. They will not only participate in Indian ranking system, but the global ranking and come off well. I think this is the idea. And therefore to support research, not just in science and technology, which is more expensive, of course, but in management, in uh, humanities and social sciences, an umbrella body called the National Research Foundation is talked about, which is going to be directly handled by the Prime Minister office. So if there is a fund requirement for a particular project or research to be carried out, which is useful to the society, money will not become a bottleneck. Today it is a bottleneck. There are multiple agencies like DST, CSIR, AICT, UGC, and everyone's pockets are you know not deep pockets. You, know, you have limited funds. So even if the project requires one crore, we'll say, we'll 20 lakh. Then do it. How do we do it? We can't do it. Then we'll write four agencies. If you're fortunate, if you get four, then maybe the jump will go. If you get two, then we can't do it. I think these are the real kind of challenges which uh, are required to be addressed. Fortunately, all of this is given in some way, maybe in a cryptic language right now, but we have to decipher it and uh, create a strategy, implementation plan, get all the resources that are required, and then have a committee to continuously monitor and review. And if it is not going in the right way, the way it is envisaged by the, you know, this particular policy, course correction and uh, handling that is also required. I think all of this is getting into shape. I hope uh, all of you will really enjoy the new policy after it is rolled out in the true sense. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Sasubude. It's such a wonderful uh, narration of uh, the government uh, take on this. And we are truly benefited by the uh, uh, crystal clear perspectives that you have given. Uh, and it's uh, actually going to help us uh, immensely in the uh, uh, times to come. And uh, of course, the implementation would be very crucial to the success of the uh, uh, NEP. And we need to be very sensitive to the pitfalls that may not be visible in its uh, implementation plan. And I'm sure uh, with the kind of focus the government is trying to give to the implementation plan, I'm sure it will work out well, uh, ultimately. So thank you, Professor Arun Sasbude, so much for sparing your time and sharing your uh, views. Now we'll move over to the uh, next speaker. Uh, we have uh, uh, Sri Harish Sanduja, is the director of Sait Anandaram Jaipuria Group of Schools and a member of Academic Council, Samarthya Teachers Training Academy of Research at Ghaziabad. Uh, Sri Sanduja, please. Mr. Sanduja, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Thank you, Dr. Das. Yeah, please, uh, yeah, I please. hope I'm audible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, audible. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm so happy to be here amongst the panelists and I, I would like to kind of acknowledge the presence of Professor Anil Sahasbuddhe, uh, Sri Bharat Patel, uh, then we have uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, Dr. Mahendra Sharma, Dr. Jain, uh, Sri Saurabh Kumar, Dr. Jitendra K. Das, uh, I think we have repeated your name and Dr. Amit Joshi. Thank you for being there. And uh, my uh, essential uh, idea of today's uh, presentation and talk is about ECCE. <clears throat> that is uh, Early Childhood Care and Education. And uh, I would like if I can be granted the permission to share a small PPT so, so that uh, what I'm trying to say can be also uh, shown at the same time if the host can grant that permission is it possible i think you can upload it yourself you can share your uh, yeah the your sharing screen. rights are right now not visible on my screen i think they need to just uh, uh, 
make the sharing rights uh, available okay now i have the rights thank you so much <clears throat> so i'm going to share a small ppt about early childhood care and education and uh, uh, basically, uh, I hope uh, I'm, my my screen is visible to the uh, to the audience and the panelists. Yes. Uh, basically, what happens is that uh, this presentation I'm going to divide it into four parts. Uh, something like what were some of the researches that have impacted the national education policy, especially the uh, early childhood care and education part and what has been the current state and what NEP talks about for ECCE and what are the tentative goals in timelines as per the government that have been shared. So um, to start with, I think uh, this was a very important graph that came out in the late 90s and in the starting of the turnaround of the century where uh, the sensitive periods in the early brain development were mapped through this graph. And this was a very, very uh, important and powerful graph for which, which came out of a research. And if you see uh, here, the yellow line is basically showcasing uh, the linguistic growth of the children. And the yellow line, which you can see, is basically not starting from zero at the age zero. So when the child is born on the same day, the child actually understands the language. It's more like Abhimanyu's uh, story coming true scientifically now, where we get to know that, okay, the child when he's born out on the, on the day zero actually knows the language and understands it, may not be able to speak it. And the second thing very interesting about this graph is that uh, somewhere by around three and four years of age, the ability to uh, understand and pick up language starts decreasing drastically. And by eight years, almost 80 to 85 percent of the language is actually which the child is going to learn in his entire life that is grasped already. And this is the time when the mother tongue gets formulated and the definition of the mother tongue is basically the language in which we talk to ourselves and the language in which we think. So that's basically the mother tongue and which is uh, formulated at this particular age and it becomes extremely important for us as educators to understand these uh, nuances and also uh, if a parent of a child is having any vision problem or a hearing problem, then the children of theirs should get kind of checked up once again somewhere around four years of age. Because if you are likely to be wearing, if you are wearing a specs, then likely your progeny or the child is also going to have an impact or the change in the eyesight by the age of around four. So these certain, um, certain uh, things are very crucial. And also one of the important things here is that numeracy and the logical thinking skill does not immediately develop at the same time as the linguistic skill develops. So the segregation there came out from this research and it was a very, very far reaching research that had a lot of impact on many of the educators, uh, especially like me who, who were dealing with people and children uh, of the age group banned from say three years to around 18 years. So uh, this showed us that the numeracy skills which actually remain high and the logical thinking continues to remain high uh, up till 18 to 24 years of age. Whereas the linguistic skill goes down drastically by around eight years. So this particular initial graph is important and I'm so happy that uh, national education policy was able to take into consideration some of these important researches of Howard Gardner and that particular graph which I was trying to show you. So I'm not going to go into the details of this, but this these multiple intelligences also had an impact. And as I see now, uh, if you see the Asar reports as well as the Pratham reports and nowadays the Central Square, Central Square Foundation also making an impact in their researches using the data of you guys and all. If you see what they are trying to sh uh, share with us, they're saying that uh, if, you, if you look at the children in the private schools or the government schools, uh, 
to start with, uh, if they can divide three digit number by a single digit, almost 40 percent of the children are able to do it at a particular age and can also read a long paragraph of grade two. This basically is class five children uh, having this particular ability in a private school around 65 percent children are able to do that. And the percentage number of children in different types of schools, which are currently uh, there in India, is also like this, that just over 50 percent in the government schools and around 35 percent in uh, private schools and around 11 and a half in the aided schools, government aided schools. So uh, these are certain statistics. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but I'm so happy to, to see that uh, the national education policy now comes up with this framework where they are uh, for the first time, as per I am concerned, they are acknowledging that the children from zero to three years of age, as well as three to eight years of age, need a particular framework of development and that needs to be kind of catered to with the help of uh, NCRT. And the government has acknowledged that uh, earlier, because the government of India was uh, uh, acknowledging only uh, the education starting from class one onwards, that is uh, uh, the formal education was not uh, below age six. Now, if you remember the graph that I showed you first, uh, by age six, the child misses the golden period of linguistic development. Now, the golden period, if it is missed by age six, and we don't do anything formally about it. So uh, that was a major, major loophole into our entire educational process. So that seems to be now getting bridged with the new education policy that we have. And uh, they, they are acknowledging the fact that 85% of the cumulative brain develops by six years. And uh, they have certain goals which they want to kind of meet by around 2030. And uh, in this whole process, they are trying to uh, plan up that the whole system of Anganwadis and Anganwadis along the primary schools uh, and the standalone preschools should be taken into care. And uh, the good thing is that the standalone preschool will also come under the ambit of uh, the schooling system. Earlier, uh, it was not necessary. They were not regulated by the education departments of the state or the center. Now they will all be regulated and there will be a standardization that will start happening at that end also. because. Uh, the schooling, which was officially starting from class one, now necessarily will start from age group three, which which implies that a child going to nursery or a pre-nursery also comes under that ambit. So this is a major change. And they're also talking about the workers and the teachers of the preschools to be uh, specially trained in ECCE pedagogy. Earlier, what was happening was it was either B.Ed or NTT or something like nursery training. But now the focus is also shifting on that, and they are also trying to say that uh, as per NEP, uh, the, the format in which the education will be transacted. Uh, first of all, uh, they're likely to be following the process of mother tongue. And second, uh, stories, poetry, song, these will be the most crucial uh, tools through which the education will happen. And one of the biggest thing which I see as a change coming up here is that for the first time in the national education policy which has come up, they have specified that a child of class three must have a 35 words per minute uh, reading speed as a goal. Now, this is extremely important because what happens is that if, uh, if a child reads very, very slow, then if you start reading the first word of a sentence and by the time you come to the third or the fourth word, and if you have taken a lot of time, then the, then the temporary memory of our brain actually loses track of what was the first word. So if you take too much of time, by the time you finish the whole sentence, you don't remember what were the first few words and hence the sentence does not make any sense. 
So the reading speed becomes extremely crucial in making sense of whatever is being read. And this has been acknowledged this time. Uh, though I see that uh, this acknowledgement is coming late, but still it is there. And I also would like to say that uh, as, as a person involved into education, I would like to share that uh, this, this specific goal of 35 words per minute is not necessarily a particular goal. I, I look at it at the, as that the government should actually widen this goal because I can see that the private schools in India, which, which have possibly a good push out at, at an early age for the children, they are able to achieve around 70 to 80 words per minute by a grade three child. Whereas the government has set up a goal of around 35 words per minute. Uh, so there seems to be a slightly dichotomy uh, existing there, but but to start with, I still find that this is a great goal to achieve because uh, a lot of schools are not yet able to do it. But at the same time, I should say that the people should not become complacent that if their children are able to read around 75 to 80 words per minute. Uh, of course, uh, the adults read close to around 150 to 300 words per minute. Now, the foundational literacy and the numeracy that the government has been talking about is essentially about reading the basic text, the ability to divide a three digit number with certain uh, single digits. And they're specifically talking about that at the, at the class three level, we would like to have some kind of benchmarking happening where the outcomes will be measured. And now this is an important thing that by class three, the government is going to come up and try to have a state run either a standardized exam or something through which we will be able to get to know uh, how many children are able to achieve this particular outcome. So those outcomes have been very specific in nature and are measurable in nature. So that's something which is quite an important thing that has come up in foundational literacy and numeracy program. And uh, this is this is just uh, 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 how uh, in, a, in an average private school, uh, we were able to see that class one child was actually able to read 35 words per minute, whereas class three child was able to read around 80 words per minute on an average. This is how the things are moving in, a, in an average private school. Uh, at the same time, the government is defining in PCCE the competency of the teachers also and the competency of the teachers they're very specific that uh, for early childhood care uh, and education uh, a candidate who is handling these children should be at least 10 plus 2 pass or plus 12 pass and should have done a six month certificate program now these six month certificate programs uh, should be coming up soon or a one year diploma program for the for the people who might not have done class 12 they might have done only class 10 so in, in case they are getting involved with the early childhood education that this will be the requirement and of course i think this these requirements will be given up by the higher education system schooling or the college or universities and the modes of this, uh, these programs, the government has accepted the fact that the mode of communication for uh, teachers at early childhood care education can be digital or distance mode, a DTH, or with the help of smartphone also with at least once a month a contact class. Now, these are certain things which the government has specified. And along with it, what is happening right now is that uh, because they have specified uh, that the people should be trained in this manner. So I see that in, in times to come, uh, the distance courses and the way they are dealt with uh, in, in terms of online structures, that will get a great impetus from uh, all this, what has been said in the NEP. Then the progression of uh, ECCE, they are wanting that the NCRT comes up with a particular curriculum. Uh, for the ages three and four and age five students should move into a preparatory class for class one. Now, when uh, 
So class one essentially uh, will be the class where the formal education of course starts, but a child should be prepared well by the age five uh, for the formal education that is going to get started. So for that, they have said that the playway methods in the preparatory schools will be uh, taken care of for cognitive, effective, psychomotor, early literacy and numeracy, and also they are looking at health checkups and all. So uh, they are wanting uh, in NEP, the four ministries to kind of uh, collaborate together, HRD ministry, which is now, of course, the Ministry of Education and the Women and Child uh, Development, uh, Health and Family Welfare and the Tribal Affairs Ministry will be collaborating. Uh, Mr. Mr. Sanduja, um, yes, uh, since we are running behind time, yeah. so uh, it'll be wonderful if you could uh, uh, so, so uh, this, is, bit, yeah. this is Mr. Das. This is my last slide. Oh, wonderful! Very good. Yeah. So the the foundation literacy and uh, numeracy mission. I think the the goal has been uh, set by the government that they want to achieve things by around 2025. At the national level, uh, they would like to have the mission cleared up by 2021 and the state level by 2022. And uh, the national framework also by 2022 for the states, and we are likely to launch ourselves into early childhood care and education systems as I was talking about by 2025. So by that time, we are likely to see the changes that are going to happen and how we are going to come up with the change. So it's very promising and I am thankful that you lent your ears to it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sanduja, for a very enlightening uh, perspective on ECCE. For me, it was a completely uh, new thing. Uh, <laughs> early childhood uh, care and uh, education. And uh, I can only reflect back on uh, some of the things which are done in the uh, in North America because uh, I had some uh, uh, first-hand experience there in, in Canada. Uh, the teachers in the um, you know, those schools, you know, where these toddlers go, uh, yes. they have to have a certain kind of a certification before yes. they can be appointed as a teacher. And exactly. these certifications were around um, psychology, child psychology, and you know, yes. things like that. I don't know whether in India it is um, enforced. Um, yeah. So and and, and uh, the teachers at uh, uh, primary school level, you know, the primary school to the teenager level, that means grade five to grade, uh, uh, the, what they call college, which is grade 10, uh, were actually very well paid teachers. They very handsome salaries because they said this is the time where the children can uh, go astray uh, in terms of their peer pressure. So they, they it is the responsibility of the teacher to ensure uh, things don't go wrong, uh, because typically, you know, in the North America, the family structure is such that uh, the children spend more time, uh, more coherent time uh, with their peer and with the teachers, not so much with the parents. So there are a lot of uh, onerous responsibility on the teachers and the government was ensuring it. So therefore, they needed a high quality teachers to be uh, you know, in these schools. So they were paid very handsome salary. I had a friend of mine with a PhD. Uh, he got a job in one of the uh, such schools. And he said, why are you doing it? So well, the salary is very good. So, so and he uh, he got a certificate uh, to be to be eligible. And so that's how, the, what I'm trying to say is the importance given to the children's school is very crucial for the uh, well-being of the nation. So uh, I'm sure the new NEP will, you know, through ECCH, we should be able to bring this aspect into uh, the mainstream. And thank you very much. Uh, so now let's have the uh, next speaker, Mr. Achin Bhattacharya, uh, who is the founder of uh, Notebook and the CEO there. Uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, are you there? Mr. Bhattacharya? Yes, Dr. Yeah, please, please. So you have... Uh, um, maybe if you could do it in uh, 15 minutes time, would that be okay? Sure, yeah, running, short of, running short of time. Yeah. I understand. No yeah, worries. Please, please, please. Yeah. Thank you. What do you now? Thank you, Dr. Das. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Professor Anil Shastra ji, Honorable Office Bearers of Association, my learned fellow panelists, and all esteemed members of the audience. I congratulate Association for hosting this session 
on a very contemporary topic and thank them for having me here. Dr. Das, with your kind permission, I'd like to share my presentation. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, your, your uh, share is enabled. You have to make sure. It's enabled. Yeah, okay. Can you see my presentation now? No, not yet. It? Not yet. Yeah, it's coming now. It's there. Thank you. Yeah. So NEP 2020, the way I look at it, is a step in the right direction. It's perfectly in line with global best practices and yet firmly rooted in Indian traditions. But the best part of the policy that I really admire is that it honestly acknowledges the challenges in the current system and lays out a vision for addressing the same in the coming years. Another very important aspect that I find is that it's very inclusive in approach. Since inclusivity is a topic on which I'd like to speak in more details, I'll come to it in subsequent slides. But there's no doubt about it that a lot of thought has gone into each and every aspect of inclusivity, both by the ministry as well as Dr. Kasturi Rangan and his team to implement the vision of our Honorable Prime Minister. Another very important aspect is increase in terms of budget allocation to 6% of GDP, which is a very welcome step, and migration from 10 plus 2 to 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4. It's a very practical step as major development of children, we would all agree, happens in those foundation years. Another very important aspect, a very interesting aspect is the element of choice that has been given in each and every aspect of the policy. I understand that there are monumental challenges in terms of implementation, but at least in terms of intent, whether it be in terms of option of four-year degree course, with last year to be spent in research, multiple entry or exit options, taking one year of sabbatical, in line with global practices, freedom of choice of subjects, combination of whether someone wants to study philosophy with physics or music with chemistry. You know, it's a policy for new India. And also, looking at aspects like vocational education, for instance, but in states and local communities have been given the freedom to choose areas of shortage where children can go for 10 days of bagless internship. So these are some aspects where I really find the policy wonderful. Now, as far as online education is concerned, edtech is concerned, it's not new to India. For over a decade, online learning solutions have been offered to students. But yet, today if I share the numbers with you, out of 280 million school-going children in our country, more than 95%, more than 95% do not have access to any structured online digital learning content. Notebook was born out of this gap. What we very consciously tried to do was, we tried to find out that what the challenges are. And I'll come to the subsequent slides as to how this is related to NEP 2020 and how we feel that we are trying to contribute our own little humble offering to this huge vision. What we very clearly understood is that there were some challenges <coughs> children across the nation were facing when it come, came to accessing quality digital content. We all understand that in order to ensure uniformity, of education in order to ensure that quality education reaches each and every child in every corner of the country. Centralized building of content and their access through handheld devices is the only way. Now, when we're looking at it, we understood that there were challenges in terms of pricing, primarily because achieving economies of scale was a challenge and not only pricing, Sensibility was about the challenge. It was important to connect with the students, to speak in a language that they could understand, to, to, to refer to a sensibility that they are familiar with. And also, we wanted to ensure that our content is engaging enough. The long lost art of storytelling, which we found in joint families that we grew up in. Today's children, considering the fact 
that post families are nuclear in nature. Parents migrating to bigger cities, working couples, and these are economic necessities that they live with. Children do not have access to those storytelling culture that we had in our childhood, listening to stories from our grandparents. Hence, when we started Notebook, we were very sure that we wanted to educate in an engaging manner. We knew, sir, that we are not here to entertain. The objective was not to come with highly animated content to distract children, but the objective was to do something which will be engaging enough. We also understood that it's really important to take the academic community into confidence, to use the wealth of experience that teachers across our country have. As part of our brand, we interact with more than 1,000 schools day in and day out. And I can tell this with full confidence that teachers in our country are among the best in the world considering the amount of dedication, considering the amount of effort that they put in. So we wanted to ensure that technology at its best could only be an enabler. We were very sure that technology cannot supersede education. Education is our purpose of existence. And technology only comes as a vehicle. The objective of which is to ensure that quality education, that we want to ensure that a great teacher steps out of his 40 people classroom, 40 people classroom, and reaches those thousands of students in far-flung areas who actually need him the most. So that was our objective. Third, coming to the language part, which we'll come to in more detail, we understood the importance of vernacular content, which will help in NEP 2020. And I'll share some case studies, small case studies to show you how tremendous the impact has been. Namaste, Bachchu. Notebook mein aapka swagat hai. Is nai video ko aapke saamne prastut karte huye, hume behat khushi ho rahi hai. हमारा उद्देश्य है परंपरागत शिक्षा को आधुनिक तरीके से पेश करना ताकि हमारी ये नई पीढ़ी या आप सभी कहीं भी कभी भी इसे आसानी से पढ़ सके हेलो स्टूडेंट्स टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टडी द स्टोरी मैडम राइड्स द बस रिटन बाय हिसाइट द किंग लुई द 16th हैड कम टू पावर इन 1774 सम पीपल हैव इज अ वे ऑफ रिमेंबरिंग साइन इज इक्वल टू परपेंडिकुलर नोटबुक में आप सभी का पुनः स्वागत है सो दैट इज अ स्मॉल वीडियो विथ रिगार्ड टू अवर जर्नी सो फार टूडे आई एम वेरी हैप्पी टू शेयर विथ यू दैट वी टीच अराउंड वन पॉइंट सेवन मिलियन स्टूडेंट्स अक्रॉस द लेंथ एंड ब्रेथ ऑफ द कंट्री एंड मोर देन फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ आर स्टूडेंट्स कम फ्रॉम स्मॉल टाउन एंड रूरल एरियाज दैट आई बिलीव इज आवर बिगेस्ट सक्सेस now digital education as i was telling you is nothing new it has been around for quite some time but what i really like about nep 2020 is it really addresses the problems it goes to the root and the importance of aspects like leveraging advantage of technology has been brought to the forefront the recent pandemic as we all saw has acted as a catalyst technology was always already there people were shifting but whatever mindset challenges were there challenges in terms of adoption to technology this pandemic has literally forced all of us to step out of our comfort comfort zones and adopt technology and i must say the way teachers across our country have adopted to technology at such a great speed even senior educators who have been teaching for around 25 30 years i personally interact with so many of them have been really phenomenal so coming to this policy you know the benefits of online education has been clearly acknowledged in the policy and also what has been really again and again emphasized on is the need to ensure that technology reaches each and every student so the need to invest in creation of public digital infrastructure has again and again been emphasized and the importance of utilizing existing platforms like diksha swam has been appreciated another very important aspect i see that has been that has been really highlighted in the policy because whenever we discussed about public private partnerships ppp model because which is really important if education has to reach each and every corner of the country online education has to reach that there is no doubt about it that it needs state support only government has the machinery to ensure that it reaches each and every student now when whenever we discussed about it the biggest challenge that we always thought was that okay we understand content is built centrally stored in clouds but how does it actually reach the student device is costly we are discussing about a country where smartphones may not be available practically in each and every household so how do we do it right these are practical challenges we just can't make a policy on pen and paper 
the policy actually addresses this problem and says that in areas like this, utilization of mediums like television and radio should be made and 24 by 7 access should be given in order to ensure 24 by access, 24 by 7 access to educational channels to ensure that children are able to access online education, quality online education. So this, I believe, is a wonderful statement in terms of intent. Another very important aspect that it acknowledges is the importance of teachers training, teachers training, especially in terms of ensuring that they're able to utilize resources at disposal in terms of online education. It acknowledges the fact that a great teacher who might be doing a phenomenal job in terms of classroom teaching may not be equally adept when it comes to online teaching, right? So this is another aspect which the policy really acknowledges. Now we all understand what the challenges are that we were discussing. Gaps in terms of resource training, gaps in terms of infra, uniformity in terms of available resources. And as I told you that we honestly believe that pulling in of resources, centralized buildup of content and delivery through handhold devices can actually ensure that quality education be uniformly made available to each and every student. Now, at Notebook, as I was discussing, that we, we, we ensure that we actively engage with the community. You know, it's really important when you teach a child, especially first generation learners who come from aspirational dis it's not only about teaching him or her, it's about reaching out to the family, reaching out to the community at large. That's a much bigger purpose, right? Mm -hmm. As we say, sir, that it takes a village to teach a child. So coming to that, in terms of notebook advantage, we have ensured aspects like augmented storytelling that I was telling you that we have drilled on. And the videos that we work on are very short and crisp videos, six to eight minutes of length, because more than that, getting attention from a child is very difficult. And also equal focus on all subjects. Earlier, what we always saw is all online platforms primarily were focusing on subjects like mathematics and science. While I don't deny the fact that they are very important, but I believe all subjects, whether that be literature, history, philosophy, are equally important for development of a child. So at Notebook, we have ensured that, second is uh, coming to how we want to, how we actually support the teachers. If you look at a typical classroom setting, a 40 minute uh, 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 Mr. Bhattacharya, if you could close it in uh, two minutes, please. Sure, sir, I'll do yeah, that. Please, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So coming to a typical classroom setting, sir, as I was telling you, that uh, this is how, a particular classroom is structured wherein notebook video is played in between the entire session with recap video at the end. We are aware now of the fatal consequences of climate change. If countries do not strictly adhere to the environmental policies around the world. The Swedish team leader Greta Thunberg has led the climate conversation relentlessly. She has initiated school strikes for climate change. The factory owners and managers preferred women and children workers because they could be subjugated better. They complained less about the terrible working conditions and accepted meager wages. Uh, only one more slide I'd like to come to is with regard to the language part. The coming to the language part, uh, in terms of bilingual content, in line with NEP, as I was telling you, that we have done some work on this, when we have ensured that when we are teaching a particular student along with English, we are also using vernaculars. So in this particular video, I'd show you a small example as to how English and Hindi are used interchangeably. And the kind of response that we have got has been phenomenal. i just like to share a small video with you, sir. Namaste, एडिसन के माता पिता उनकी भावनाओं को समझते थे उन लोगों ने हमेशा एडिसन की सहायता की तथा उसके साथ साथ खड़े रहे एक दिन मुर्गियों को अंडे सेवते देखकर उनको ख्याल आया कि मैं भी अंडे सेव Today's lesson, we will have a look at Edison's childhood and try to find an answer to this question Thomas Alva Edison was born in 1857 in Milan Ohio of the United States of America. He had a curious mind ever since he was a child who would ask many questions and want to know the right answers. Thomas Alva Edison ka jan America ke Ohio raja ke Milan mein sun 1840 mein hua. Edison ko bachpan se hi jyasu prabhu ke baad. So uh, 
those are some small uh, experiences that I want to share with you. At the end, I'd like to close with this remark that there's no doubt about it that this policy is taking the right direction. But when it comes to implementation, I guess all stakeholders of the civil society, whether that be school owners, parents, active participation from children, local government authorities, everyone needs to come together to actually ensure that this policy is implemented, not only later, but as well as in spirit. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bhattacharya. Wonderful. You have done this in 15 minutes time. That is of great help to the time management here. And uh, the emphasis that the technology can play in the children's learning, uh, you have very aptly uh, brought out and uh, you're actually uh, contributing to make it happen. Uh, and uh, in the current times, uh, not because of the COVID times, uh, but as such, because the technology, uh, uh, you know, uh, proliferation on, in anything and everything that we do is really very important. And uh, uh, so how the technology can be used to enhance uh, learning experience, and particularly when you're talking of, you know, the nuclear family, you don't have the grandparents, so that uh, part of the experience, life experience, is missed out by the uh, children. So how you're trying to fill up that gap. So, so, so these are very important elements of the personality development of uh, children and the learning experience that they have. So, so thank you very much for uh, uh, what you're doing for the school kids and uh, society uh, at large. Uh, now let's have, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. Now let's have uh, the next speaker, Dr. Mahendra Sharma, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor and Director General of Ganpat University. Dr. Sharma, are you there? Yeah, I'm yeah. there, Dr. Now, das. Please, if you can also do it in 15 minutes time, that would be sure. wonderful. Yeah? Sure. Uh, so uh, over to you, Mr. Dr. Sharma. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Das. Uh, in fact, uh, equally thankful to uh, Mr. Uh, Bharat Patel and uh, the entire team of SOHM for inviting me on this forum. Uh, and I'm the only one, I think, from the university set up from Gujarat. Uh, and I, uh, I am the, uh, also from the home district of Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Bhai Modi. So my university is the first university in his home district. And uh, we had uh, his blessings and vision. And because of his, his vision, we established Marine Engineering, which is the only marine college of the state, which has the biggest coastline. And we were the first one to establish faculty of skill development uh, way back in 2012 uh, as a full-fledged faculty. Uh, national education policy as such, uh, if we look at, has uh, uh, five characters. Uh, one, it is Indian in nature uh, because it talks about uh, our languages, it talks about our values, and um, it, it would have not been more apt a time uh, to uh, refer to our values and uh, our languages uh, while we were moving ahead 80 years from independence and while our first uh, national document, the education policy, Dr. Radha Krishnan Committee report, uh, talked about um, universities uh, as organs of civilization. And uh, the very first document, uh, which was published, I, I understand, in 1948. And it talked about as an uh, uh, organ of civilization and as a basis for growth, both economic and social development, but was rooted deep into our value systems and was rooted deep into uh, what, as a country, we carry as our strengths. Because uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan was very much, uh, ad uh, very much vocal and advocate about knowledge as well as education actually giving strength and mm -hmm. enabling students to face uh, the hardships of life and uh, for the first time uh, there is a policy uh, which is talking about uh, not only the knowledge imparting but also enabling the students so uh, as a document uh, it makes a student uh, more uh, as a chooser than as a receiver and uh, the policy is making education an enabler, uh, then with a limited scope and focus. So that is the transformation uh, that this policy is bringing. The second thing this policy is doing is it is having international flavor and character also because it brings the best practices. It talks about multiple entry, multiple exit, which uh, Dr. Sastra Budde was mentioning. 
and a uh, lot of universities in india uh, when the skilling mission started uh, and uh, there were a lot of sector skill councils came up they tried to convert their semesters and they mapped it along with the sector skill councils and additional certificates were issued to the students and it was also mapped with uh, international uh, bodies like ukeri uh, tape australia swiss vat and those kinds of uh, employability enhancement opportunities were given and this opened the door so this policy also gives that uh, uh, flexibility and openness uh, to universities to experiment to innovate and that's where it would be truly transformational and uh, probably for the first time uh, indian industry uh, would be the most benefited one because universities would work very closely with them and at my university we happily say uh, there is a concept which is growing and would probably will become a reality soon that is university inside the industry and industry inside the university so that's uh, the phenomena uh, which has already started and in my university uh, just to give you an example ours is the only pharmacy college uh, which has a tablet and fluid manufacturing unit uh, since last 10 years inside the pharmacy college and uh, the students they participate and alumni manage them so uh, it's it's a very unique initiative that we did uh, the second uh, initiative uh, when we implemented automobile engineering uh, we had a semi automobile assembly line inside the university by suzuki motors and where the cars are assembled by students so uh, it's it's a, a very different kinds of hands on learning that we initiated and created and eventually if i look at 20 years of journey each of my institution each of the discipline we operate into has a center of excellence tied up with a company under their csr and has an hands on learning experience so a lot of foreign students they come to the university because they don't get such opportunities in one setup so a lot of students can take multiple credits uh, by having hands on experience uh, on to uh, different kinds of centers of excellences while they are doing their formal degree so this this particular policy actually is enabling universities to experiment more uh, on those innovations it is interactive in character Uh, because it allows uh, students to move uh, from one faculty to another faculty one institution to another institution taking credits and uh, that's where uh, this flavor uh, would enhance employability as well as entrepreneurship uh, all these years uh, particularly universities in uh, semi urban and rural areas uh, were functioning in an island situation with the industry but this policy is giving that ability to students as well as to the faculty members to experience uh, those kinds of uh, advantages accruing out of from the best institutions now uh, the policy is impactful in the sense uh, that it is outcome based uh, it's it's driven by uh, uh, the credits the students are taking as well as uh, by giving them options uh, have and for employment they can take an exit route also so uh, there is a, a, a impact uh, which this policy is talking about and is uh, very much linked uh, with the economic and social development of the country and is as the earlier uh, speaker mentioned uh, is inclusive in nature uh, it talks about uniformity and uh, that's where uh, while we are talking about uh, the nep uh, as a policy uh there are certain things uh, to make it more effective um, i i am drawing from what uh, dr sahastra budde was saying and uh, uh, that university autonomy it talks about university autonomy and i will again refer to the first draft of dr radha krishnan committee and i will read a para uh, which says that higher education is obligation of state but state aid not to be confused with state control over academic policies and practices so the autonomy has to be uniform and the roles of both the regulator as well as uh, the universities have to be clearly defined and there should not be any misunderstanding on it and when we talk about the uniformity uh, the private players uh, be given a very judicious <laughs> equal treatment and for that there has to be an element of trust 
uh, the words might be harsh, but um, uh, th those are realities as we operate universities. Uh, uh, but then uh, the element of trust uh, would remain uh, the important part. There is a term uh, which the policy mentions. It talks about public spirited leadership. Now, this policy also talks about who would be leading the setups, the universities and the institution. And there is a word public spirited leadership which is very important in the, in the terms that it is talking about that uh, the selection of the person who would be leading this mission of educating has to have certain values and those have to be uh, brought out in terms of code of conduct, code of ethics and universities and institutions have to implement it. So uh, that's a, a significant part. And for the first time, it is being talked about in such a vocal term. Uh, however, the entire thing uh, would be enabled by the strength of the teachers, because there are two things. Universities are the receiver, because uh, NEP has opened doors for a lot of innovations and um, uh, transformations, both at school level as well as at the university level. So the universities are actually facing a transformation from both the ends, from the receiver end, because they receive students from school, and uh, while they are educating the existing one. So they have to balance uh, the challenges uh, evolving from both these uh, aspects and have to manage uh, their business in a way uh, that they have to ensure uh, that there is a smooth transition uh, while it's happening. So a lot of uh, thought process has to go and deliberation has to happen. Uh, at my university, we have already have a, we already have a task force uh, NEP implementation task force uh, with each facet clearly defined, and we are coming out with a phased planning component that uh, what is doable for us in phase one, phase two, and phase three, and we are trying to map it uh, with what government policies are coming and how it would be impacted uh, and affected uh, over the period of time. Uh, having said so, uh, uh, while uh, Dr. Sahastra Budde uh, talked about uh, regulations being uh, tight and light, uh, uh, in fact, uh, regulations uh, have to must have an element of trust, uh, which I would like to add on to it. It should be light, it should be tight, but should have an element of trust. Uh, while we deal with uh, the regulators, we feel that while we do a lot of good job, uh, but somehow uh, that element in the eyes uh, has to be there and they should uh, be open to appreciate. Uh, I, I don't find regulators appreciating the good job done. So uh, that, that is where the element of trust comes. So light tight with trust uh, would actually uh, work as miracles. Uh, uh, and uh, while there are provisions of uh, holistic education and liberal education being talked about, uh, liberal education has to be understood. A lot of Indian universities uh, have confused themselves uh, with the models existing uh, on liberal education front, and uh, that has to be clearly spelled out uh, in terms of what is uh, the concept of liberal education, which is because liberal education, which started from USA, uh, it went to Western Europe, uh, had a, a very strong basis of evolution. So uh, we have to understand uh, the liberal education models which we see in India today, uh, unfortunately, some of them, uh, it, it was focused on uh, students who were supposed to go abroad, uh, but could not go. Uh, they were uh, kids of uh, people who could afford a lot of uh, uh, formal foreign education. So just to enable them uh, by giving a four year degree and uh, giving them a roadmap so that they can go abroad, uh, rather than making it more meaningful in terms of deeply rooting it into a format where a student explores himself, uh, his skills, and then evolves in a discipline uh, where he or she can develop himself uh, into uh, employment or entrepreneurship. So uh, there has to be a very clear understanding of liberal education and a lot of brainstorming has to be done while it gets implemented. And that would actually bring uh, things together. Uh, there is a time limitation, but I, I remember a quote 
ऑफ निदा फजली एंड इट सेज यही है जिंदगी चंद ख्वाब कुछ उम्मीदें तुम भी चल सको तो चलो so uh, which our honorable prime minister also used in the parliament uh, but yes nep gives us a lot of opportunity uh, we have to understand uh, its uh, uh, framework and uh, the possibilities it has opened to us we have to shed uh, the legacy which we are carrying on our shoulder understand the merit of the legacy but evolve on this new framework with the government has given us and probably for the first time a uh, government is has opened its door uh, to the executors also and they are trying to walk along so uh, it cannot be a better time and more opportunate time uh, while we are moving towards uh, new india and we are looking at india as a 5 trillion dollar economy uh, we have to understand the role of education as an enabler of economic and social development and taking the maximum advantage of it uh thank you very much hope dr das i i limited myself with the comment uh, yeah yeah thank you thank you so much uh, dr sharma you are absolutely on the dot and very uh, uh, very well done as far as timing is concerned so we are saving a lot of time and uh, one of the important take away from what you are saying which uh, i consider really very uh, relevant is the element of trust uh, in the uh, regulation being uh, light but uh, tight uh and i can only say that uh, in india uh the government's uh, way of looking at citizen is of not to trust them the classic example is that you have to submit your certificates to the government they'll ask you to get it attested now if the attestation um, you know i mean you just go pay some money this guy will attest right and that's how it is it's no more than a formality only in the recent past when the uh, this current government was in uh, power then the attested certificate uh, to be submitted by university uh, students was uh, done away with so 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 self declaration is a good enough uh, declaration while in the yeah. western while in the western world uh, citizens uh, statements are considered uh, trustworthy so if you are lying then they charge you with perjury and the uh, action is very quick and fast and severe in the western world in india a charge of perjury to a citizen i don't think anybody would do anything to that who sorry bol diya baat khatam ho gayi you know literally and if there even there is a case it will go on for ages and no harm will be done to the person who has uh, uh, lied or been lying so there is a lot of connection between the justice system that you have in the country and the kind of um, framework that you have for rules and regulation uh, implementation to make it efficient right so this is one important thing that uh, i got from your um, uh, discussions and the other important you, when you said that you know we need to the, the country is aspiring to be a 5 trillion dollar economy and if you look at the uh, the linkages between the size of the economy and the level of higher education then they are very closely linked with each other yes you yes. see you cannot see a higher end economy where the ed- higher education is in the doldrums right so as long as your higher education is in shambles you cannot dream of a higher end uh, uh, economy you know uh, because you would not be able to sustain it so the higher education and education per se because it is the primary and uh, you know secondary education that feeds into the higher education quality uh, that the education has to be um, you know at a level which the other country should uh, you know uh, say that well this is the place to go to for higher education uh, or education as we talk about uh, when we want to go to the us or the uh, euro so the size of economy or the health of economy is uh, very closely intertwined with the state of education system in your country and you when you go back to uh, the ancient days of uh, uh, nalanda or uh, takshila and uh, vikramshila at that time the state of economy in india was a very high level in terms of contribution to the world economy so there is a close connection so i think yeah. it is very appropriate of the government to give it a push to the education in our country unless and unless the education reaches a certain higher level you really cannot uh, aspire to reach the uh, third largest economy of the world it can only remain a pipe dream so yes, yeah. so i think uh, this nep is just in time 
and uh, we need to ensure that this gets implemented uh, with full fervor and absolute uh, top end uh, efficiency and i'm sure it will work out well for us so thank yeah. you dr sharma thank you so much thank for sharing you. your views thank you now now we have to move to the uh, next uh, speaker dr umesh chandra jain he is the secretary north zone of uh, association of chemistry teachers and principal academy heights uh, public school uh, dr jain are you there yes sir uh, yeah. am i audible yeah. sir yeah, please. So you have uh, alloc been allocated 10 minutes. Right, Down sir. by 2-3 minutes, that will be wonderful. So yes, if sir, you can I wrap it up in about 7 minutes, that will be great. Yeah? Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you so much. Over, over to you, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jitendra Das, sir. Good afternoon, Honorable Professor Anildi Sahaswadi, sir. All the dignitaries and my dear friends. The new education policy 2020 is the third education policy since independence. There are many major aspects of this policy which will certainly transform education in the country. This policy set out the path for education in the country for the next 20 years. It seeks to address the entire gamut of education from pre-school to doctoral studies and from professional degrees to vocational training. It is also a response to the unfinished education agenda set by two previous education policies of 1968 and 1986, which was modified later in 1992. In doing the same, the name of the Ministry of Human Resource Development changes to the Ministry of Education. Now I'm coming to some of the very important provisions of this policy, both for school education as well as for higher education. The one very important Um, I think I think <laughs> this is yes, a, a bandwidth issue. So I'm going uh, 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 stopping my video uh, so that uh, uh, Dr. Jain has sufficient bandwidth. So we all can uh, mute. Uh, I mean, we can mute and uh, turn off our video so that um, uh, Dr. Jain has a certain uh, bandwidth issue that can get addressed. He's gone offline. I think, sir, perhaps uh, he has some issues that he can answer. No, yes. he's, coming, he's coming back. He's coming back. Dr. Jain. This uh, school structure proposes a shift in the pedagogical yeah. structure. Yeah, yeah. 1986 yeah. policy. And uh, to a very new design that is 5 plus 3 plus 3. So they are the four uh, stages, foundational stages and uh, preparatory stage, and uh, middle stage, and secondary stage. So this brings early childhood education as preschool education, and it proposes the extension of the right to education to all the children up to the age of years. At the stage, basic skills such as reading, writing, speaking, listening, solving, basic uh, arithmetic will be developed, and these skills acquired in the early age will definitely help them to perform in their higher classes. It will also enable them for critical thinking and problem. The point is a new learning framework, a new curriculum framework, that is national curriculum framework for school education, NCF, SE, is to be introduced, including preschool and study, which will be undertaken by the NCERT. This policy also focuses on reducing the bag loads of school children, setting up a National Mission of Foundational Literacy and Numeracy will ensure basic skills at the class 3 level by 2025. <laughs> classes on coding as well as vocational activities. This is a very important point, such as carpentry, guard landing, uh, guard, gardening, electric works, pottery, etc., from grade 6 and onwards. Indian knowledge system, including tribal and indigenous system, will be included into curriculum in an and scientific manner. It will increase employability factor of the youth, the need of the hour. Another important point of NEP is that 
it proposes no rigid separation in the arts and science between curricular and co-curricular activity between academic stream and vocational medium of structure preference of mother tongue or regional language or local language as a medium of instruction until at least grade 5 will certainly promote multilingualism among students and will enhance the power of language in the country. Uh, now I am coming for the reform examination, transformation in the assessment of students comprising easier board exams, 360 degree multi dimensional progress to reduce the fear and pressure of the exams. This is very important point. So this has been uh, made provision in the uh, NEP. Thus, NEP talks about moving from high stake examination to more continuous and comprehensive evaluation. It focuses on experiential learning, critical thinking, and discourages the role of learning and the stereotype examination. NEP will bring about two crore children into the mainstream. Increased exposure to vocational education from class six and onwards, internship opportunities to learn vocational subjects throughout grade six to 12 will certainly make students ready for the real world to meet out the challenges of the 21st century. Thus, it will increase the employability factor of the youth, the need of an hour. In higher education, the subject academic bank of credit transfer and multiple entry exit points will ensure that everyone can complete a college education and learn the subjects of their own choice. The college affiliation system, which prevented curriculum innovations, will be phased out. Thus, it will be allowed industry linked curriculum and uh, faster modifications based on industry need, therefore, helping the students in placement. NEP 2020 aims to invite about 100 foreign universities in India, which would provide quality education at an affordable cost so that Indian students can also get the opportunity to study in the best universities of the world. Similar Universities from India will be established abroad. The NEP proposes to increase the education share from 3% to 6% of GDP. Adding the National Educational Technology Forum will certainly boost and support the digital India vision and mission of the government. Except for law and medical education, the HECI, the Higher Education Commission of India, will be established. In order to promote research in, uh, in country, National Research Foundation will be founded as in say, there is National Science Foundation. It will also provide funding for such. For disabled children, students, special provisions have been made, such as Bal Bhavan boarding school be established. This is a very special point of the uh, <laughs> higher education. Uh, all higher education institutions will be autonomous in the 15 years. One of the important features of NEP is introduction of contemporary some subjects such as artificial intelligence, design thinking, holistic health, organic living, etc. Certainly open new doors for students and will be an effective uh, uh, doc, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Jain, uh, your seven minutes are uh, done. So if you could uh, uh, wrap up. Oh, okay. Yeah, please. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. So many challenges are there as you know whenever and uh, a policy is implemented several challenges are there so uh, the main challenge uh, i i think uh, they, in a federal system any education reform can be implemented only with support from states and it seems to be a difficult task of building a consensus on many ambitious teachers organizations will also have to play a major role in the transformation of the policy as with every policy the real will be translating it into action if the government else but implements most of the recommendations on school education and higher education indian education will go miles uh, conclusion is this all in all nep 2024 for each and every student it focuses on skill development experiential learning developing life skills and increased use of technology in education that's all are my views on NEP 2020. Further, I would like to thank SOCM for giving me a wonderful opportunity to give my insights on this interesting topic of NEP 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jain, for a very interesting take on the school level education and uh, trying to focus on uh, 
the uh, vocational aspect of it. If you go back in time, then the earlier model of 10 plus, uh, uh, what was that? 10 plus 2. So 10 plus 2 model was essentially, or 10 plus 2 plus 3, was essentially um, uh, expected to deliver on the vocational aspect. That means that the, after 10th level, everybody need not go to uh, plus 2. And after plus 2, everybody did not go to plus 3. But, uh, you know, they're not other, you know, matching complementary uh, aspects in the society, in the governance, in place. So, therefore, everybody would end up, uh, by and large, uh, going towards uh, graduation. And then after graduation, uh, unemployment, unemployed graduates as a data, as a statistic. That was the issue. Now, with the 5 plus 3 plus, um, um, uh, 5 plus 3 plus 3 model, uh, back in... Uh, uh, the, the, in our uh, model now, I'm sure uh, we would be able to handle some of those issues more uh, efficiently. So uh, thank you, um, Dr. Jain, for your views on this. And now let's move over to uh, the, our next speaker, uh, Sri Saurav Kumar. Uh, he is the Director of Academics of Vidya Mandir Classes. It's a coaching institute, right? So I'm sure he will be giving us a new perspective on the impact of NEP on the implications of the entrance examination, which is his theme. Uh, uh, so, Mr. Saurav Kumar, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so, you have been given 15 minutes time, and if you yes. could uh, close this in about 12 minutes, that would be great. Right. 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 I think we can go in from there. Yeah. 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 Is a uh, looping of your voice. Yeah, now it's okay. No, it's not okay. Right. Okay, fine now. Yeah. yeah, it's okay now. Secondary market, we have to secondary market, and we have to. Great. So, good afternoon, everyone, and I am honored to be a part out of SOCHM uh, event on national education policy. Honored to be uh, with the uh, associated with Professor Anil, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, Jen and other people, uh, so learned uh, people all and around me. I will be taking up my, uh, with you with the highlights and uh, its implication on the entrance exams. So first, let us look at what are the highlights of these policies. <laughs> The policy uh, has been again first uh, focusing on the fundamental learning curriculum, which has been divided into two parts, uh, which is from age three to six in ECCE model. I think uh, Dr. Sandu Sanduja has, has uh, very nicely uh, uh, talked, told us about uh, the NCCE uh, model. And uh, it was a great uh, insight into that particular model. Now, uh, let us look at uh, the other aspects of the uh, policy. Uh, the, then we have uh, uh, prior to the age of the five, uh, the, every child has to go to a preparatory class, which will be known as Balvatika. So that what was discussed clearly was uh, uh, that, that in India, what uh, uh, a London member said, that there is no, uh, you can say, certification for a teacher to uh, teach a preschool kid and from where he starts learning. So I think this should this will be coming in place in NEP and the teacher or the instructor who is uh, being uh, training the students in Balvatika will train them uh, uh, according to the, <clears throat> you can say, the psychological and the other learning objective processes uh, so that the child learning curve forms very smooth from the very basic childhood until he goes to the higher education, right? Then uh, in the second thing, it is the age grade, uh, in the age uh, 8 to 12, so grade 3 to 5 is the preparatory stage, then play, then discovery, then interactive classroom learning. Now, where uh, the, the, the this policy has come up with very, very great things. One is obviously a blending of uh, IT, the, you can say uh, the online and the computer aided learning, or you can say the interactive learning. Second thing which had, it has come up with in the schooling, in the preschooling or schooling is, uh, it's the, is the including of uh, coding in the, in the 
uh, uh, junior classes, right? Now, when we say <coughs> uh, uh, that uh, the uh, the school learning or the formal learning uh, up to the age where you uh, before you going to the board or going to the college you you will be trained with interactive learning or coding will be there from class 6 what nep says uh, clearly now my uh, my point or my whatever interaction i have with so many schools across the country because uh, we work very closely with the schools so um, all the schools are right now clueless absolutely clueless how to go about with the coding from class six because as of now i don't think or i don't feel that uh, schools are so much clear how to go with coding from class six because there has to be a curriculum that curriculum has to be uh, such that the child at that age can learn that thing it might be uh, a block programming it might be scratch or it might be other simple uh, you can say app based game, uh, learning right so and how from where this much large instructors will come in who will enable the coding from to such large volume across the country now that is a question which all of us has to answer if it it gets implemented from 2021 or 2022 right so uh, most probably the the policy says from 2022 right so can we get so many instructors and the infra ready in the entire country by 2022 right secondly when we say interactive based learning so can can we enable our schools across the uh, the country uh, to uh, to deliver that interactive based learning now that is these are the two challenges which i look at uh, with a great initiative coming up from the uh, current government right so obviously this policy is uh, which is applauded across the country and even uh, outside the country as well right so and 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 what interesting thing which i found it in this policy in school is is that you will not be only judged on the basis of one single exam which is your board exam right so it will be a continuous learning process and you will be formatively assessed uh, for the particular class right now say for example i being a mechanical engineer i had a interest in playing keyboard right but at the at when i was studying 20 25 years back i didn't have any option to go for any subject uh, such like that but the students who are coming up light right now they have that particular option to blend their learning with their hobby or any uh, the science student can choose a humanities or a or a humanity student can choose one one subject from science right so if we say why iits are great greatest right so and and if you see the iitians coming out from the engineering college are good entrepreneurs as well right so one of the reasons one of the reasons can be because they are also being taught very nicely the economics the psychology right so all these humanities uh, subjects which plays a very very vital role when you come to the management and when you run a company or when you start a startup so all these things uh, make a lot of value to your education so i think when these all things will be clubbed together so this will make a literally uh, a hell lot of difference in creating out value from the graduates now, now the the other things which uh, uh, which we have which i have already told that you can uh, uh, give the board examinations at three levels and board examinations will not only be the only examination there will be a formative assessment system which will be continuous throughout your uh, uh, your year of uh, preparations through that projects and all those stuff right another important thing comes up is uh, <clears throat> Uh, when we go uh, to the higher education now uh, the thing which coming up in from 2022 is that the nta will also conduct a entrance exam which will be uh, for all the colleges or universities twice a year right now nta is doing this for engineering only it is conducting twice a year for engineering for medical it is conducting only for once a year right maybe it will happen from uh, coming years now what happens is say suppose i live in delhi and i have applied for delhi university at the same time i want to apply for osmania university in hyderabad so i have to fill up two forms and give up two examinations or go through the two selection processes now coming up with this i think the ease of uh, getting uh, the admission into the higher colleges will become more easy. Now here also uh, one, uh, one challenge which I can see because uh, uh, we, we uh, train so many students uh, every year. So uh, in JEE, uh, 
uh, what is happening is nta conducts exam twice a year and in uh, once in january and once in april as 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 a general standard process but because of covid it has been disturbed this time so in january there are six days on which examination is considered uh, uh, conducted and similarly on uh, april there are six days on ex examination is con uh, conducted so there are 12 basically shifts 12 days and 24 shifts so 24 different sets of papers are there now now uh, uh, what what we always feel is or I think uh, there has been a lot of uh, petitions in the court also that it is very, very difficult to make the 24 set of papers on the same standard and then judge a student uh, based on that. And then you put up a normalization process. Uh, we can do a lot of statistics in it and we can uh, ISI has helped NTA in normalizing that. Uh, but still, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, parameters are there, which which doesn't put everybody on the same platform, right? So let us see ki how this uh, university uh, testing uh, system will comes in. So the number of shifts should be reduced in my personal opinion, so that averaging or uh, the normalization can be done a little better way, right? So uh, there is a an exit rule also uh, see if somebody doesn't want to uh, or you can say somebody is not able to continue for the three years of or four years of his graduation so if you exit after two years you will get a uh, certificate if you exit after two years you will get a diploma and uh, it is just not if somebody is uh, you can say uh, <clears throat> dropped out after first year or you can say dropped out of second year so his, his degree is not completed now here comes in a very very interesting point say suppose i am a student and I'm studying in any of the prestigious colleges of the country and a startup idea comes into my mind. And I am in second year of my uh, degree or my engineering or whatever it is, right? Or first year of my engineering or my any degree course. Now, I cannot wait for three years or four years to execute my idea of startup because till then the idea will may become stale right so with this policy i what positivity i can see is that ki if i am uh, if i am of an entrepreneur uh, mindset and if i have a good startup idea uh, in the first year of my uh, degree course or the second year of my degree course i can halt it there and i can uh, execute that idea and uh, sometime after i can come back to my degree or in some poor families or families where people have uh, certain personal challenges they can't complete uh, their degree they can they if they have to take a halt their education is not being halted right so they can continue after that also so that's also a very very welcome uh, you can say step from uh, uh, government of India in the in this new education policy and the program here also is multidisciplinary. So <laughs> means you can say that IITs may run humanities also or uh, 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 some other colleges can run uh, which are famous for science can run humanities or famous for science can run uh, uh, fam colleges famous for humanities can run sciences. So that that will become a very, very great uh, things coming up right now uh, all these things coming uh, up, uh, higher Mr. education uh, Mr. council Mr. has to be set up uh, which will uh, 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 you can say uh, discredit all organizations which seems to be but don't know how that that will be executed and how much time uh, will it take Mr. But of course Mr. coming up with a single body it will be very easy for the colleges to license up their day to day uh, uh, working and the norms and the standards which are being set up for the various types of colleges uh, although this eliminates the law and medical as already uh, told by Dr. Anil. Uh, so these are the mere higher thing and the, uh, the, the, the most important thing which uh, which comes oh, from higher education is uh, can you hear uh, me? bringing up uh, you can say foreign universities in okay. India. Uh, don't know how much value they can create but still it's a very very welcome step because uh, most of us who want to pursue degree from uh, you can say some other country maybe uh, mostly Indians are more fascinated to go to uh, US for their degrees, but because of the cost. You're muted, you can't hear. So you're over. Uh, but because of the cost, I think uh, they are not uh, able to uh, go to uh, US uh, uh, because it, it carries a lot of cost, say some 1.5 to 2 CR. So if these campuses comes into india i think it for a normal citizen or a, for a middle class citizen uh, things can be better and they can pursue that particular degree so that was all what i wanted to share 
here and i once again thank each and every member of SHM uh, for uh, inviting me to be a spokesman uh, where all such learned members are there thank you dr das for yeah. thank th thank you mr kumar for a very good uh, exposition on the nep and the benefits uh, it uh, provides to the students particularly the entrepreneurship aspect of it um, uh, we are still behind time uh, by the schedule given uh, we should have this is a 110 it should be 110 so we are on time uh, if you look at the add up all the times given to all the speakers we are at 110 and we are at 110 so we are exactly on time from our perspective. Uh, so we have had these um, very learned speakers uh, share their views on uh, NEP and uh, really very happy uh, on uh, the way Asuchem has organized this. Uh, on one hand, we had the uh, chairman of AICT uh, sharing his views in a very clear and uh, crisp and lucid way uh, on what all the um, aspects of the NEP are there and uh, how it should be seen in terms of uh, regulatory as well as the uh, uh, implementation uh, aspect. We have had the speakers uh, coming in, sharing their views from the school, the children's learning point of view. Typically, we from the uh, business school, we tend to miss out, but then it is, <coughs> but it is the, the strength of the children, the quality of uh, children's education that fits the higher education. And we have also seen uh, the quality of higher education is highly uh, closely aligned with the uh, economy of the country. So it's high time that we needed to give a, a special impetus and focus on the quality of higher education that is being implemented in our uh, uh, country today. So I would like to thank you all for sharing your views. Now we have uh, the last part of it, the Q and A session. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Amit Joshi to come and uh, take care of this uh, Q&A session, please. Dr. Joshi, are you there? Yes, 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 sir. So would you like to take over and uh, handle yes, this Q&A? Yes, I'll just... Yeah? Uh, thank you that very is, much. It's my work, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Me, uh, thank you very much uh, for making me a part of this session. And uh, I think we are at the end of the session and everyone would be waiting to just leave the session. But before we just end this session formally, uh, I would like to ask a few of the questions which I have been through uh, all these times when the national education policy was on four months and we have just a lot throughout it. And we have all the panelists with us. So I will have an uh, two, three open questions, and then I'll come to specific questions. And I think in another five to seven minutes, we will find up this session. Uh, so what what my first question to uh, an open panel is, how the, will the role of universities change when we say that NEP will give autonomy to all institutions or all colleges in India? So how? Will the universities rule because right now universities are autonomous in, in announcing their courses, colleges are not, but slowly and gradually we are giving this autonomy to colleges as well. So how will the role of universities change in the coming time? I think if uh, Dr. Sir Budhi is there, I will be happy to hear from him if he's listening to me on this point because because there are uh, approximately 2000 universities in india and there are around 50000 odd colleges so how that that transition will happen in years to come uh, amit uh, i have listened to you uh, the question is very apt there are about 40000 affiliated colleges to some uh, 300 odd uh, state universities and there are 10000 standalone institutions basically <laughs> postgraduate diploma in management kind of institutions. Uh, plus, uh, there are several others, like in the domain of design, art, etc. So they are all standalone approved institutions. So 10,000 and 40,000. So this is the number. And the number of universities in India are 1,000, not 2,000. Uh, 1,000. And uh, of that, either deemed universities or private universities enacted by the state assemblies and central universities, they constitute a bulk, you know, around 700 of them altogether. So around 300 are the actual state universities who affiliate these colleges. So all these 40,000 colleges which I refer to are, are linked with these 300 plus uh, whatever universities 
of uh, state of Delhi, state of Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, like that. And each state has somewhere 10, 15, 20 such public universities. And therefore, the real challenge is when we want to reduce this number of colleges from 40,000 down to around hardly 1,500, there are two things which need to happen. One is starting of new universities by the state in all such districts where there are no universities today. So where from funding will come, whether it is purely from state government or from central government or 50-50, some mechanism has to be worked out in the implementation plan. So there are about, uh, say, 150 odd new universities which will crop up. And these will affiliate already existing colleges in their area or domain. Today, four or five districts together have a university where the affiliation takes place. So that gets distributed and instead of unwieldy number of uh, colleges being handled by one single university, this number has to be gradually brought down. So all of this is not going to happen overnight. It will take 10 to 15 years time. So maybe we should have a plan strategy that in the next three years, any university which has more than 400 affiliated colleges has to come down to 400 or 300. Uh, that means there must be a new university in the same area. But I am giving an example of, say, Uttar Pradesh, Lucknow. Adjacent to Lucknow, some district, a new university will come up. Colleges affiliated to Lucknow, some of them will be transferred to that new university. So this one change will start happening. And still there are 300 odd institutions. How do you reduce further to 200 or 100? And if you do that, that uh, conglomeration of uh, institutions will happen and the institutions will come down to around 2,000, 2,500, whatever, and all of them are universities now. No, nothing is going to be called as an ordinary college which is affiliated. But this will take 15 years' time. Uh, but the road, roadmap should be clear that in three years we will do this, six years we will do this. So there is a role for university in doing all this, number one. Number two, in terms of all other activities which I mentioned, multidisciplinary nature, credit system, choice-based credit system for students, uh, giving credit to the courses done by students of our university from some other university. I think this exchange uh, between universities in the form of MOU, uh, all of that uh, has to start happening. See, the spirit of collaboration, which is so vital in the today's world, is not happening in our academic institutions. Forget about university to university. We simply jump suddenly to foreign universities. We want to have an MOU with foreign university. Why not some other university in our own country, which is doing well? So I think that is the spot spirit. And we have found that many research projects sanctioned to uh, institution faculty, they don't even share with their department faculty. Forget about other departments, other institutions. I think we need to break these Berlin walls which are there within us. And once we start doing it, there is a big role for each university. And therefore, a lot of uh, uh, you know training for our faculty to understand the policy on one side. How do we make them aware of the challenges and opportunities that exist in this policy, through this policy? And how, what we say as uh, the Traditionally, the, the mindset, you know, which is the most important, significant change which is required, uh, right from university vice chancellors down to the faculty members is the next aspect. So this kind of training sessions are also important to educate people. And if you do all that, we will not succeed 100%, but at least a big change of 20% in the first year, 40% in the second year, that roadmap should also be there, that in the next five years, everyone's attitudinal change will also change. I think I was very, very impressed by the uh, Harish uh, Sanduja's uh, presentation about uh, school education. I think that is what has to happen in the higher education as well. How do we really empower our faculty? How do we really empower our students? What kind of tests are to be conducted? Our routine, rote learning type of examination have to be given away. This is too much actually. How from rote learning to higher levels of learning to be evaluated in terms of Bloom's taxonomy, training of faculty in that. I think I'm very happy that AICT started all these reforms three years ago in 2017 with a executive committee meeting, elaborate discussion. And uh, most of that has found place in the new national education policy. Uh, thank you, sir. And any, any other person want to comment on this question before I move on to the second question? 
Okay. Uh, so there is uh, one more question which I think which is perfectly suited to this environment because when we talk about foreign education, there are a lot of Indian students who after their uh, schooling uh, for undergrad courses and specific undergrad courses for their graduation courses. They go outside and that number is approximately, if we talk about a number, maybe 400,000, 300,000, if we talk about the whole community who is going outside India to study. So, uh, do we think that this national education policy addresses this situation in the coming years down the line? May, maybe say, let's take a, uh, talk about 10 years down the line. And the second question is, if instead of uh, having these kind of undergrad courses, students going outside India or graduation courses outside India, are there some short term courses which can be offered through Indian institutions? They are being offered. I know they are being offered. There are semester exchange programs. There are all the, those programs there existing. But is it available for mass number of students so that the practice which is being done from Indian students and that is a very huge number. I think Dr. Sirs Bhuti has traveled almost uh, across the globe, uh, seeing different institutions how they grow and the numbers of uh, students which they are studying, like in Canada, US, UK, Europe, they are large, Australia, there are large number of students. So can we come up with a plan in next few years where uh, we can offer, even Indian institutions can offer very short term courses, like we talk about MOOCs. So such, uh, such kind of MOOCs courses, maybe not online, maybe physical, maybe digital, but those universities can offer through that education. So that will help and stop brain drain from our in your students to the foreign country. So this uh, does this policy address such kind of issues maybe down the line in 10 years. It's open to the forum. I think I think uh, if, uh, AICT has already started in the last one and a half years. The platform called as NEET. I don't know how many of you are aware. It is called National Educational Alliance for Technologies. And, and this takes care of whether it is universities or startups or even big or small companies who have developed products which are useful for this personalized learning because each person does not learn the same way people learn different way their initial uh, status is different but the end result should be almost similar and to achieve that target there are softwares which have been developed by companies they have a fee so what we innovated was when we keep asking everyone that you give pro bono pro bono because the regulatory body, we always say that if you give free, we will take it. And then we will sign an MOU. Some people did give it. Those who have got deep pockets and they have some other business from which they can draw money and give CSR activity is fine. But small startups who have struggled in order to create that product cannot live without uh, getting some return. So we changed and said that we will test the product. If it is right, we will not even say what should be the charge to be levied. But every four students who buy that product, you have to give one seat free, which will give it to the deprived sections of the society, economically, by you know, those whose income is less, SC, ST, OBC, so that society, it is not that we should take care of only those who afford, but those who can't afford should also be taken care of. I think with that spirit we started. We have about 40 odd products. They are all in very emerging areas. After you do that certification of six months, four months creation, you are both employable and you can create your own startup as well. I think that is the starting point. So there is a way out already started. So with that as the background, in the new policy, if the universities create some kind of such infrastructure where they will create some kind of courses, which are short term courses, but our students need not go abroad, but we can attract foreign students also here in India. And I think that is what is possible through this means. I'll uh, see uh, uh, one point uh, I would like to add here. You know, the earlier policy of 10 plus 2 plus 3 could not deliver on its objectives 
because the the certification requirement in india is negligible for a lot of jobs like for example somebody who is driving a bus so you this person would get a uh, commercial vehicle like a license but if this person is driving a school bus now, driving a school bus is supposed to be very different than driving a bus so now in the um, in the for example in south korea in uh, almost all countries you need a driver needs a different kind of a driving license to be able to drive a school bus because there are regulations safety matters and everything so moment those regulations are required to put in place the requirement for this certification will increase like for example somebody who so uh, what are the specific requirements you know in india we do not have any such uh, uh, what is called vocational uh, requirement as a mandatory thing a lot of jobs which are taken up so uh, in the western world like for example just a small example if you are in a restaurant uh, in uh, or let's say electrician or a plumber in india electrician or a plumber by and large they will take up job anywhere just because they know how to do it in the western world they need a small certification uh, that they are a plumber they are professionally qualified as a plumber or professionally qualified as a mason uh, so we don't have that today in our country so unless those regulations are put in place the requirement for the small small certificate courses will not increase and that's why 10 plus 2 plus 3 not deliver because that was the whole idea so i think the government should also need to focus on if it is doable Uh, that to enforce these kinds of regulatory requirements, and therefore the need and the demand for the short duration in uh, certificate courses, which can be delivered to these, uh, uh, you know, these skill development institutes, will shoot up like anything, and that will do a lot of good to the professional outlook of uh, anything and everything that is delivered in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Das. And uh, my second last question to the panel is. Uh, in the national education policy there is a term mentioned as national testing agency so what do the panel think about how this national testing agency can help uh, conducting college entrance examination or how it will be fruitful or how it will affect the overall system which is right now running throughout the country i think dr bhattacharya also can answer this question so uh Thank you, uh, Mr. Joshi. I think uh, setting up a uh, national testing agency is a very welcome step, no doubt about it. And we will for sure ensure uniformity in the entire screening process. Six boards in India with their own different evaluation criteria. And when it comes to college admission, there is a soft marking pattern. But definitely, when it comes to uniformity. A national education services process. So, very important. Uh, NEP 2020 stresses on the much more planning stage for application of knowledge, which is the way to go. Now, considering the fact that because of competence in terms of admission process, students are very much focused on good marks. This also will change up to a large extent because when you understand that in order to get admission to a good college, we have In terms of international test, we work more on concepts of clarity. You know, which is the real purpose of education. Thank you. Ah, uh, thank you very much. Any other pan panelists want to speak on this? Yes, Mr. Sir. Yeah. I think we are not able to hear you, Dr. Sir. You are un muted. Ah, uh, Doctor Joshi, we are at one twenty-nine as a time. Yes, sir. and so, I so have one last question. Session, session, session Association has scheduled eleven a.m. to one p.m. and in the schedule it is supposed to add at one twenty-five. 
they just error. Uh, if you add up all the ties one to it, so it's it's about time we closed it because I have some other engagement also. No, I'm also yes, leaving. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, look forward to thank you me. all sometime thank soon. And thank you everyone on behalf of SHM and the all organizing partners, uh, GR Foundation. Uh, and all the partners notebook who is the academic four school of management thank you very much for joining us for this session thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.